Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jenny Flanagan from Associated Hair Professionals, a new association supporting hairstylists, barbers, and nail professionals with business resources, marketing materials, and liability insurance. Annual membership is only $179 a year for all of the benefits. For more information about our association, please visit insuringstyle.com. Today's presenter, Larry Kopsa, is a certified public accountant and partner in Kopsa OD CPAs. It is a CPA firm specializing in salons and spas. As a former salon owner, Larry understands the financial and management challenges that the industry faces. Larry serves as a national consultant to salons and spas and as an international speaker. He has also published numerous articles regarding financial management in major industry publications. Without further ado, I present to you Larry Kopsa. Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you happen to be located. It's an honor to be here to have a chance to talk to you today. We're going to be talking about income taxes today. And, and um, a lot of people would rather have a root canal than talk about income taxes. But you know, we spend a lot of money on income taxes. And, and my purpose here today is to uh, show you how to possibly save some of that money. And uh, Jenny, Jenny gave, uh, appreciate the introduction, Jenny. Here is, um, here's our information from our firm. Uh, we are located out in the Midwest. In, in York, Nebraska, right outside Lincoln, and we have our website here. And um, one of the things we do, if you're interested, we do a blog for our clients, and uh, and actually it's just for anybody that signs up. It's not client specific, and it's a uh, but it is specific to the salon industry. For example, here is uh, our most recent blog, and uh, I talk. Uh, somebody got a question on medical premiums on the W-2. I answered that question. Someone said, "I heard we have to start putting." Uh, uh, health insurance information on the W-2. Well, only if you have over 250 employees. And what else did I have out here this week? I also talked about, oh, we, I'm doing a little series on QuickBooks. A lot of our clients, we recommend QuickBooks. A lot of our clients, a lot of people work on QuickBooks. And, and so we're doing a little series on uh, questions on how to fix different QuickBooks items. Here's, uh, there's a change in the tanning tax. If you have uh, tanning, uh, there's a, a new tax out there on tanning that came in and 2010 as part of uh, the uh, Obamacare Act, and and so uh, there, there's a change that just took a place here in October of this year, and uh, just in some of the comments I have, uh, student aid website, just information. Uh, you know, we say information is knowledge. You know, knowledge is, knowledge is power, and the more more knowledge you have, the better you can run your business and be a better business person. So that's just something that we do. And and uh, so if you're interested, uh, I'll have Amanda. This is Amanda's email address: a h a u m o n t at kopsaoti k o p s a o t t e dot com. Uh, if you're interested in that blog, it's free. Uh, send us an email. What we do is on. On Mondays, we send out a constant contact uh, and say, here's the four or five things I wrote about. And then you can click on them if you want to read them. If not, you don't have to. It's just, it's just out there. So, so that's uh, our blog. But you came to talk about taxes. Let's talk about taxes. Uh, you know, I've talked to people about taxes for a number of years. I'm, it's one of our fortes here. I, I'm very fortunate. Um, I'm, I'm recognized enough in the industry that are uh, that here in uh, the end of uh, October, I'll be speaking to about 250 CPAs uh, here uh, about uh, all the income tax updates. I get to do that at the annual CPA conference. And and so um, uh, taxes is one of our, our many things. I also teach an income tax class at our local college. And so taxes and tax savings is very important to us. But I know this. I know if I just say, hey, here's how you can save taxes, that doesn't, I need your help. I need my clients' help in order to help them save taxes. So, so first thing I think I need to do, I got to motivate you a little bit. So I'm going to start down and motivate you a little bit about how taxes work and, and why you need to be motivated to take a little time out of your day every once a day or once a week and sit down and just think about taxes. Then I'll give you the knowledge. That's what people really want. And I wish I could give you the discipline. I guess if I do a good enough job on the motivation, Maybe they're just going to be there, but um, that's the way I do it. Now, as we go through this, if you do have any questions, I'll, I'll have Amanda's website, uh, excuse me, Amanda's email address. You know, go ahead and email me, and I'll be glad to respond to you as just part of this uh, webinar. And, uh, and if you have some specific questions or need some more information on any of the things I talk about, 
uh, just go forward and, and, uh, and let me know. So let's get into it here. Here's some motivation. Here's motivation number one. It's motivation for me. You work, if you're the average American, uh, you work from January 1st all the way through April 17th, January, February, March, and half of April just to pay your income taxes. Uh, so and, and and real estate taxes and property taxes. That's our tax freedom day. So we work and uh, three months, three and a half months a year just to pay taxes. If you're an average American, some of you guys are working more, some are less. And again, it depends what state you're in too. Some states like Connecticut, you're working, you know, like until July, actually until May or so to pay taxes. But uh, uh, but that's tax freedom day. And you know, our taxes really going to three different classifications. There's federal income tax. We all know about that. That's the checks to the IRS. And most people have state income taxes, a few states like Texas and Florida and, and, and South Dakota. And there's six states that don't have state income tax. And then Social Security and Medicare tax. And actually, Social Security and Medicare tax is probably your biggest tax. That's a flat tax. That's that's uh, 765 actually 5.65 percent this year of your of your um, of your wages or your earned income uh, and and if you're if you're self-employed I understand there's booth runners out there if you're self-employed it's 15.3 uh, percent normally this year they give us a little waiver it's 13.3 this year but it's if you think about that of your net income the government gets uh, for Social Security purposes, 13%. So right after that, you're in a 13% bracket. And then you start adding the federal end and start adding the state end. Pretty soon you're in a 30% bracket. Let me show you. Here's tax bracket creep. Husband and wife, two children, both under 17. Not the husband and wife, the children, okay? Husband and wife, two children that are under 17. He makes 48000 in his job at the factory. She makes 36000 as a boots runner or in the salon, and they're not itemizing deductions. They don't own a house. They don't itemize. Here's their current tax bill. Federal tax is $5,900. State tax is $3,500. His Social Security that's being withheld from him is $3,600. And the wife's Social Security that she has to pay in because she's self-employed is $5,000. So their total tax bill is $18,000. Now, I want to show you tax bracket creep. What happens now if I just give her another $1,000? So what I'm going to do here is instead of making 36, she makes 37, OK? So now their taxes go up from 18208 to 18563 well, that's not so bad. You know, what are we talking? We're talking five hundred and fifty, five hundred and fifty-five dollars. Wait a second. That's that's thirty-five point five percent. That means that thousand dollars that she brought in, she didn't get to keep all thousand dollars. She only got to keep six hundred and fifty dollars or somewhere in that neighborhood. So the government got thirty-five percent of it. The purpose of this again is to kind of motivate you. So if that's you. When you make that extra $100, the government's getting $35. Now, let me take you another step further. Let's assume, now, we're still up to 37 and i got to tell you, I set this up. So they jumped into the next tax bracket. So they were here at 18563 So that's this number right here. They were at 18563 Okay, what happens if she makes another ten thousand dollars? So instead of thirty-seven, she makes forty-seven thousand. And I set this up because what happened is they jumped into all of that, all of that ten thousand dollars. The government got forty-three percent. Forty-three percent. You know, that's a huge amount uh, of taxes. And so a lot of times people they 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 their their penny they they, they pinch their pennies on there and they save money, but then when it comes to taxes, they just whatever happens to me happens to me. You can't do that. Recently, I uh, was interviewed by uh, Salon Today magazine. I think of the April issue, um, and the 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 person who was writing the article said, "Well, what do we tell people about uh, taking stuff to their auditor or to their accountant?" I say, "You know, that's the problem. If you, I don't care how smart I am, how much I know salon taxes. How, I don't care. I don't care. I could be the, the smartest accountant in the world, but if I get a box of stuff." And I gotta, I gotta go through that box of stuff and try to figure out what's deductible and what's not. I can't do it without your help. So you have to really help us participate in what's deductible and what's not deductible and by by giving us some organized information, and then and then take some of the things I'm going to be talking to you about and now and say, hey, I have a question on this. Is this a possibility? Is this a possibility? Because. I don't expect you to know taxes. Taxes change all the time, and they're just changing even more this next year. So anyway, you can be in a. Would you agree with me? You're either in a 35 or maybe a 43 percent bracket. See, these people are only making right here. They're making seventy, eighty-five thousand dollars, 
and, and they're up in that higher bracket. So you have to be planners. You have to be thinkers. You can't be a sitting target. You can't let them do it to you. You have to do it. All, and you can't wait until April 15th. You've got to do it as you go. So here's motivation. Okay. Any of you guys out there, let's say I came to you and I said, you know what? I, I My wife's family's coming in, the cousins and, and, and a lot of the relatives are coming in, and there's 80 of them. And we're going to get a family picture, and, I, and I'd like to really uh, uh, have them look good. I, I, would you, if I, if I bring all 80 of them in, could, would you do 80 new clients at 50 bucks a head? Uh, and I would imagine a few of you are raising your hand and saying, yeah, I do 80 new clients at $50. That would be pretty good. So, so here, oh, here's, here's my wife's Uncle, Uncle Ned. You can see him here. He'll be, he'll be the first one in the chair. He hasn't got a haircut for a long time. And there's, there's Betsy back there. She's uh, Betsy, you know, that's her second child back there. And there's Uncle Or. But anyway, uh, well, maybe you might want to do my wife's family. And don't tell her I said this, okay? okay. But anyway, so here they are. <laughs> so let's look at this. Here's what I'm talking about. Here's what I'm talking about. I want you to feel this, okay? Just kind of feel this. You just did 80 clients. Wow. 80 clients. My 80 clients came into my salon, and, and my staff did them. Or if you're a booth runner, you did 80 clients. And, uh, and, and my average price is 50 bucks. Well, but wow, I just made $4,000. Oh, wait a minute. 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 You know what? You don't get to keep all 4000 because you've got to pay your distributor for back bar. You've got to pay for a retail. If you're on the salon, you've got to pay your, your producers for, for cutting the hair. You've got credit card fees. You said you put it on a credit card. That's about 2%, 2 to 3% of your income right there. And you've got payroll tax on all those people. So it's going to cost you, if you're the average salon, it's going to cost you about $2,400 in cost. So that leaves you $1,600. Well, that's okay. I still have 1600 bucks. That's pretty good. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember, Uncle Sam's going to take 34%, so that's 1000 bucks. So work backwards. So let me tell you this. So isn't finding a way to save $1,000 in taxes just like doing 80 heads of hair at 50 bucks a peep or 160 at 25 or 40 at 100? You see the point? You see the point? So you can make yourself some money by participating in the tax planning process. Oh, my God, here's, here's our 80 clients coming in. You can... Just can you feel that? Can you feel all the hair you guys? There's ten. There's twenty. Can you feel all the hair you guys sweep up? And oh man, I can just about feel my varicose veins popping out. My oh, I gotta deposit all that money. I gotta reorder all those supplies. There's fifty, eighty heads of hair. So, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, when you get this, if you if you download this, you'll have this chart. So, if I can find a way to 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 save, to, if I find a thousand dollar deduction. That's going to save me $330 in tax. But wait a second. I don't have 330 I got to make 500 to bring on 330 So I got to ring up this much. So it's like 25 heads of hair. So this is a little bit of motivation. A little motivation. Hopefully I've motivated you. Isn't tax planning worth it? You got to help me on it. Okay. Now there's a book out there. It's called How to Pay Zero Taxes. You don't have to buy this, but it's a good book. It talks about some credits and other things. All that stuff you can just get right off of uh, your income tax on IRS website. But the point I want to make about this is that the big point that Schepinger makes throughout this book is if you have your own business, all these things you can deduct. All these things you can deduct. But you got to go after them get them as a deduction. You don't need to buy this book because you already have your own business. So all you have to do is, you know, is be a participant in the process here. So if I could tell you one thing, if I could tell you one thing, this might be part of it here. This would be maybe what's on top of my list. And if I can drive this into you, there's two types of money. There's two types of money. I'll show you an example in just a second. There's something called before-tax or pre-tax dollars, and then there's after-tax dollars. So pre-tax dollars, after-tax dollars. Pre-tax dollars are better than after-tax dollars. Anything I can move from after-tax to pre-tax gives me a great advantage. So pre-tax dollars, after-tax dollars. Remember those terms. Now watch. I'll give you an example. Here's my son. He's over here. This is a year or so ago, and he's a little bit faster and a little bit taller than that. He's a uh, sophomore in high school starting today, first day of sophomore in high school. And he's a runner. He's a cross-country cross -country runner, and he's a good runner. And he, he came to me last year, and he said, Dad, there's this running camp this summer. I'd like to go to this running camp. I said, okay, Ryan, well, 
how much does camp, camp show me the information and what's this camp cost? I, he said, well, Dad, it's $500. So I ponied up and I wrote him a check. I wrote a check to the camp for $500. So my question is, what's the camp cost? Now, most people are going to say the camp costs five, the camp costs five hundred dollars, and you're probably right. That's what I wrote the check out for. I wrote out the check for five hundred dollars, but you can't think that way. Think this way: what the camp really costs. If I'm in a forty percent bracket, I got to if I got to make eight hundred. Follow me. I got to make eight hundred and thirty-three dollars, and I give the government their forty percent to have five hundred dollars left. So the camp costs me eight hundred and thirty-three dollars. So if I'm a, if I'm a haircut and I'm doing fifty-dollar haircuts, you know it's cost me whatever many that is. You know it costs me sixteen, seventeen haircuts, right? Or even more than that when I have to pay my back bar and everything else. That's what it costs for him to go to the camp. So so that's because why? It's after tax dollars, okay? That's after tax dollars. Now, what if I get a little planning here? Let's do a little planning. Ryan's 15, he was 14 last year. Uh, I hired him and I paid him $500. Now you might say, what did I pay him $500 for? I'm an accounting firm. He shreds all our documents. We, uh, uh, we, we, don't, uh, we don't throw any papers away. We shred everything before him. He shreds all our documents. He, he comes in here, he does some cleaning. Uh, he, he does some yard work for us, whatever. I can come up with something that he can do. And I give him, my company, my company gives him $500. And I say, you know what, Ryan, I checked the state law, and the state law says I've got to provide you with food, shelter, clothing, and a reasonable lifestyle. And I don't think running camp is in the reasonable lifestyle. If you want to go to running camp, you pay your own dang way to running camp. So he pays his own running camp way. And, oh, by the way, he's in a zero tax bracket. He can up to $3,950 without any income tax. So he pays his own income tax, and he pays no income tax. So he's got $500. He writes out the check. Oh, and that's not all. If I paid him $500, and if I'm in a 40% tax bracket, I just saved $200 in tax. So now I'm paying for that camp with after-tax dollars, so the camp cost me $300. Okay, 833 versus 300 you get the point? So what we have to do, and what I'm going to be talking about today, is trying to move things from below the line in after-tax dollars up into business deductions so we can get them as a business deduction. Okay, that's the important thing. But see, that's where you got to help us accounts out. And unfortunately, a lot of tax preparers, we prepare tax returns, we think of ourselves as tax planners. Unfortunately, most tax planner or tax preparers, you know, they take your information, put it on the forms, give you the bill, and say, okay, here's what you owe, or here's your refund, and that's it. I mean, you have no way to know whether or not they did a great job, good job, whatever. You just have to trust them. And so being part of that planning process is, is really important. After tax dollars, before tax dollars. Remember that. Here's our tax rates. Now, one of the things that is happening to us this next year, people call it tax Armageddon. Uh, Congress is right now sitting out there, and they are not acting on anything. There's only been 54 bills passed by Congress this year. How about that? 19 dealt with post office renaming. <laughs> 19 dealt with, no, excuse, take that back, 16 dealt with post office renaming, 4 dealt with uh, 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 reviving existing laws, and, uh, and there was, anyway. So they're sitting there playing politics right now, unfortunately, both sides, Republicans, Democrats, everybody's playing politics right now. We go back to uh, pre-2010, 2000 tax laws. We go back to pre-2001 tax laws effective January 1st of 2013 if Congress doesn't act. And that's going to be very expensive. I figured a family of 95 with two kids would cost about $5,000 if they're making $95,000. Uh, and we're working that all the time. And you might say, well, Larry, why are you talking about this? We're salon owners. Uh, and we're, we're booth renters. Well, the reason I'm talking about this is this is your clients. And so watch this closely. I mean, if they have $5,000 less discretionary income, it's going, to be, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But here's the existing tax rates. The zero rate goes away. We're 15, and we go all the way up to 39% next year. Uh, now, there's normal deductions out there. And uh, that's you know, it's normal stuff that's out there, and I'm not going to talk about advertising. You guys know about that, or I'm not going to talk about uh, you know interest expense or insurance. You know, and oh by the way, if you don't have insurance, you guys better get it 
you know, it happens. You know, it just happens. Liability insurance is very important. Boots runners, you know, you don't have any workman's comp right now. So, you know, take a look at your, you know, think about that. My wife was kind of a quasi boots runner. We owned a salon, but before we were married, um, she was, she, she moved into a new salon, and they let her have a chair to manage the salon and to bring her overflow. And uh, and she, uh, I remember coming home from a hair show, and she, we weren't married yet. I remember coming home from a hair show, and she was showing me these new shears she got. And she said, down, she called me the next day about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. She cut her knuckle off. Well, guess what? She didn't have a workman's comp. She didn't have a workman's comp insurance, and she was out of work for probably four or five weeks because she could put her hand in water. And so, you know, insurance is very important, and uh, you know, certainly liability insurance is even more important. I mean, I, it's just it happens, and people are kind of too crazy these days. Uh, too many attorneys. If there's if there's any attorneys out there, I'm sorry I said that. Don't sue me. But people are, uh, you know, so I'm not going to talk about those things. I'm going to talk about things that, that people maybe miss. I think that's why you're on this call with me. I think I'd like to talk about some things that, that, you, that you may not be thinking about in turning some after-tax dollars into before-tax dollars. So there is nothing in the tax code that says here's what's deductible and here's what's not deductible. Uh, the only thing in the tax code is something called Section 162, and it says this. There shall be allowed as a deduction all the ordinary and necessary expenses paid or incurred during the taxable year and carrying out a trade of business. I thought, that's beautiful. Those are, those are to a tax cap, that's the most beautiful words in the English language. There should be allowed as a deduction all the ordinary and necessary. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write, when I get a chance, I'm going to write a song about this. And it's going to be my main lyric. It's going to be what's deductible is the name of the song. Watch for it. It'll be out in the country western charts. Soon. But that's what's deductible. There's no list out there. Now, if you want a list, you know, email Amanda and say, hey, send me the list. Because I made a list of everything I could think of that's deductible and non-deductible. And it's the most boring list you ever read. But everybody seems to like it, so we send it out. There's no cost for that. So if you're interested in the list, just email Amanda. You'll see her email address in a little bit. And, and say, I'd like to have a list. And it tells things that are deductible, S corporations, C corporations. LLCs, uh, general partnerships, boots renters, and things that are, are not allowed because there are some things that are not allowed as deductible by court cases. And so we kind of listed those things out there too. So if you're interested in going through that, so what does this mean? Ordinary and necessary. Ordinary. Well, let's see, they, they, they interpret that. Ordinary. Expenses that are normal, common, and acceptable under the circumstances by the business community. So if everybody else is doing it, they're doing it. And necessary expenses that are appropriate and helpful. Okay. Man, that just about takes everything. So this makes it really difficult. Um, this is part of the knowledge. I want to I want to kind of show you. So what we did is we did a chart, a little flow chart. Here we go. Is the expense ordinary and necessary? Is it necessary? Is it helpful in the business? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. Is it a current expense? What's that mean? That means is it for this year or is it go over into more years? So that means Okay, I you know I buy some new chairs. Okay, there's a way to deduct that up front, but usually you have to depreciate that. So you have to depreciate that. So is it a current expense? Ordinary and necessary. It's got to be a current expense. It's got to be for this year. And there's some other little rules about that, but that's kind of the basic of it. So I pass that. Okay, is the expense for business? Well, sure. I mean, if it's not for business, what the heck? Is it reasonable? Uh, sure, it's reasonable. Okay, now we get this one here. Is it barred by law? Well, some expenses are barred by law. So let's go through it. Okay, uh, Larry, I want to go to Paris, and I'm going to get my hair. I'm going to look at a new salon. I'm going to look at a salon there because I'm thinking we're remodeling my salon. And I want it to look like a Paris salon. Uh, and can I deduct my trip? And I, I have some other questions about travel, but I just say, okay, let's say that was your primary purpose, and that's all you're going to do is go over to Paris and look at the salon. Wink, wink, okay? So is it, is it an expense ordinary? No, sir. Yeah, probably. Is it a current expense? Yeah, be a current expense probably. Is it for business? Yeah. Is it reasonable? No. Okay, that didn't work, okay? So it didn't work. Okay, Larry, uh, hey, I'm going to put a sign on the side of my car. It says Townhouse Salon, and I put my telephone number, and I'm going to get my car as advertising. Good idea, huh? Okay. Is it ordinary and necessary? Yeah. Is it current expense? Yeah, because of advertising this year. Is it for business? Sure. Is it reasonable? Yeah. Is it barred by law? Yeah. 
it's barred by law, so I can't take it because there are court cases where the courts have re reviewed the tax law and said it's quite clear that within the tax code it says vehicles have to be depreciated and so therefore it doesn't work. You know, and you can sit here and play this grid with everything. You know, uh, can I deduct my dog? You know, that whole thing. So, so this is the grid that we follow in ordinary and necessary. And this is the one we have to kind of be careful for. So that's what's deductible. That's what's not. So, if I can turn expenses that I normally would have into tax deductions, then we've obtained true tax victory. In our salon, when we owned our salon, we sold it about 15 years ago. My wife is a stylist. She's got five sisters. They're all stylists. They were stylists at one time. Uh, and we owned the salon, and then our son Ryan came along. We decided to get out of the business, which we did, and we sold it. And But, you know, one of the things we, we did, I'll give you a couple of examples of, of some of the things that we played with. One of the things we did is, and this is truthful, one of the things was we thought our salon had it to look a certain way. One of the our one of our, our our strategies was we didn't have anything hanging on the wall that wasn't framed. You know, we we wanted we didn't want just pictures of people's hair. We wanted framed pictures. We when people came to our salon, we wanted to, to to feel a little more spa-ish, if you will. Maybe that's the best way to explain it. And so what we did is we put these pictures up. I also know and and we had rugs down, not carpets, we had rugs down, and I also know that people like new, you know, they like to see that change going on. So every two years or so, we would swap out these pictures. We'd bring new pictures in, we change the rugs around, and so now we had these rugs and these pictures, we had a store someplace. Where is the best place to store a framed picture that costs two, three hundred dollars uh, or more? Uh, depending if I was buying or my wife was buying, and I was the one that was paying more actually. Uh, where's the you know, you know, put it in the furniture room. I mean, it's going to have to get all banged up. You know, at home on the walls was the best place to store pictures. So now, don't get me wrong. I didn't buy a picture for my house and take it to my house and, and deduct it on the business. Uh, -uh. Huh, huh. that don't work. That's illegal. What I did was I put it in the salon when it served its useful purpose in the salon. We we pulled it down. We put out new pictures. We took the old ones at home. And our house decor happened to match our salon decor pretty well, and the, and the carpet also. Same with music. You know, we, uh, back in those days, you know, we had uh, DVDs. And uh, and uh, we played a lot of Yanni-type light jazz music, that type of thing. And, uh, and of course, we wanted to rotate those around. And uh, and that was just our, that was the culture we were trying to create. Well, where's a good place to store music, you know? Not at the salon. Somebody's going to steal it, or we're going to lose it, or it's scratched up. So we could take those things home. Uh, and I had no problem with an auditor on that, because uh, who would want to listen to Yanni? I mean, it's not my favorite music. But anyway, uh, so if we can do that, then what that, that, that $300 picture that I bought, you know, which would have cost me like $500 after tax, now I got for $300, I got a deductive, so now it costs me $200. You follow? Before tax dollars, after tax dollars, but you got a plan. You got a plan. Uh, so that's true tax victory. Okay, let me give you some examples here. Can I get the clothing? These are questions. I kind of oh, mom required to wear black, or uh, I have to pay, portray a, a professional image. The answer to that is no. The tax law is quite clear. This doesn't. This fits that one. Is it barred by law? There was just a case within the last six months where a person that was a newscaster, a lady newscaster, she had uh, deducted all her clothing. And she said, I don't wear these clothes outside the news organization. And the, the court says, wait a second. The law says if it's suitable for use in public, if it's suitable for use in public, then, it is, uh, then it's non-deductible. It's personal. And even though she never wore it, that's okay. And there was an older case, a New Orleans case several years ago, where uh, a girl worked in a boutique, and the and the and the case even said, even though she said she's a je even though she proved that she was a jeans and t-shirt girl, and that she was required to wear boutique clothing in the boutique, the law is law. So anyway, no, but okay, but now listen here, but damaged clothing is deductible. Now, I don't know about you guys, but you guys work around a lot of chemicals. I know my wife and our staff, they were always getting something on them. I mean, it was just 
just the nature of the business. So what we do then is, if you know, for sole proprietors, so we just write it down. What's the what's the fair market value? We have some fair market value sheets. If you want, you can you can get from us, uh, or you can go out to the Salvation Army website. So you know, if I had a blouse that maybe I paid you know sixty dollars for three years ago or two years ago, a year ago, and uh, I damaged it. I've had it a year, but if I go to the Salvation Army website, it says uh, a blouse in good condition is worth $20. My deduction is 20 And the next question people usually ask, if you were live with me, but do we have to have a receipt to prove what we paid for it? No. It's, uh, you don't have to have a receipt. You just say, here it is. Now, I want documentation. I want documentation. That's maybe number two, I got to tell you. Documentation, documentation, documentation. That's really, really important because, I, you know, maybe now I need a picture of the, of the clothing uh, and showing the damage. You know, and then I, I, I certainly need that Salvation Army website, how I valued it. So when the auditor comes in and says, uh, I see you take a, a deduction for $300 worth of damaged clothing. What do you got here? Well, oh, well, you know, we, you know, auditors get their hair cut too, and so they know what it's like. And so, on. you know, we work in a chemical environment, and we got color on us and everything else. And so, here is, uh, here is the, um, he, here's a picture of the clothing, and here is the list from Salvation Army of how we valued it, and uh, and and that's it. You you proved your point, and if you prove your point, that you're probably going to win. If you just say, well, you know how it is, we damaged about three hundred dollars worth of clothing, you're probably going to lose. So you got to have the documentation. If you don't have it, you you know, if it's on paper, you, you can prove it. It works. So don't forget that. You know, okay, wait a second. Three hundred dollars worth of clothing. You know, if I'm in a thirty-three percent tax bracket, I just saved a hundred dollars in taxes. I just saved a hundred bucks. You know, and he might he might say, oh, that's that's a lot of work. You know, if you were walking down the street and saw a hundred dollar bill flitting around, would you pick it up? Yeah. You know, so pick up that hundred dollars that your mission comes down with clothing. Oh yeah, and another advice: don't use the same picture every year. Okay, that's that's a that's a joke. That's a tax joke. Okay, don't use the same picture every year. Anyway, oh so. What about shoes? What about shoes? Aren't those cool shoes? I love those. Huh? If I wish I could find them, I'd give my wife some shoes like that. Um, what about shoes? They, you know, technically, here's a technical. They have to be orthopedic. They have, you know, if you really want to deduct your shoes, if you had something from your doctor that said you are required to wear these shoes, I, I think then you would be, it'd win. But they have to be. I don't think these are orthopedic shoes. They probably cause you to have orthopedic shoes. But uh, shoes are not deductible. Every once in a while, I'm teaching a class, and someone will say, um, "My accountant lets me deduct shoes." Well, maybe I don't know. You know, maybe the orthos in the shoes. If you buy some of those uh, Dr. Soles or something like that, I don't know. But but shoes normally generally are not deductible. Uh, what receipts do you need? Now here's another one. Here's another one where I say documentation. You should have a little book. I have a little book in my if I, if you were sitting in front of me, I I reach in my back pocket, I show you my little book. I got this little book where I write everything down. And it's not so hard to write things down, you know. If you if you think about what it's saving you, for I have some of this. For items under seventy five dollars that you normally don't get a receipt for, you don't need a receipt. So if I go out and I take one of my staff people out to McDonald's and we have a meal, and we discuss business before, after, or during the meal, and I pay McDonald's 20 bucks, I don't have to have that receipt. I just have to write down in my little book, McDonald's eating with uh, Candy Odi, my partner, discussed acquisition of something. Uh, meal $20. Now, uh, taxi cabs, I don't need that. I don't need it from the tax cab. I always leave the maid when I stay uh, in hotels. I stay at hotels maybe sometimes a little more than I want to, uh, my travel. Uh, but I always leave $5 for the, for the maid. And uh, I don't get a receipt from the maid, but I write it down. I get it deducted. So when the auditor says to me, hey, what's this here? What's this here? I say, well, uh, these are a list of things I didn't get a receipt for. Here's thirty dollars for taxi cab. Here's, you know, and you know we have a saying out here in the Midwest, and that's pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. Pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. So don't be a pig, you know, don't be a hog, and say, McDonald's, you know, uh, breakfast, McDonald's, seventy-five dollars ain't gonna work. You know, I mean, I think uh, auditors could be smarter than that. So, so remember that you don't need a receipt for those things that. You know, you're at the grocery store and you pick up 
uh, People Magazine because uh, Jennifer Allison's in there, and everybody's saying they love Jennifer Allison's hair, and you need to see you need to see the article. You know, you, you paid five dollars for the magazine. Well, maybe I'm getting a little nitpicky here, but for the three percent tax, I saved dollar fifty. See, it's those little things. Sometimes people come to me and say, Larry, I just want one big thing so I don't have to pay any taxes. I say, ain't one big thing. There's a lot of little things. They add up. Little things add up. Write it down. Magazine. You know, because you bought the magazine with all your groceries. Write it down. A magazine. Five dollars. Jennifer Allison's hair. That's all you need to do. All you need to do. What about how long do you have to keep these records? I have a record retention checklist if you like it. Uh, email Amanda, I'll give you your email address in just again, just a little bit. Uh, email Amanda, she'll be glad to, uh, uh, to to send that to you. We don't charge anything for that either. Uh, and if you're interested, but if you ask me, I'd say five years. You know, three years is how far they can go back. Five years is probably a little safer. But if you know, if you have a building or something like that, it's, if, you know, and they say, I, for example, I have a client right now selling her house, and she said, well, I paid this much for the house. And I said, well, how are you going to prove that? Well, it's been 15 years ago. She has to keep that for three years after she sells the house. Same with equipment. Three years after you sell the equipment to our, our business, so that type of thing. So some of that stuff has to be kept a little bit longer. That's in my record retention numbers if you want to. Okay, what about driving? What about driving? What about driving? Well, let's talk about driving. Before we talk about back forth work, let's just talk about driving. Uh, it depends on your primary purpose primary purpose is what it depends on. So if I drive 100 miles round trip uh, and I go and I uh, meet with a client or I attend a meeting and then I go see my grandkids in that same community and then I drive home, what was my primary purpose for taking that trip? If my primary purpose was to attend that meeting or to pick up those office supplies or salon supplies or to, to check out a computer that maybe I didn't buy or to attend a meeting uh, with a client or if I'm on some boards or that type of thing. That's, I'm the one that determines my primary purpose. And, and, then if I, and then if I go visit my grandkids while I'm there, that makes that a deductible trip. So at 50, you know, 55 and a half cents a mile, this all adds up. Um, and I think a lot of people miss the miles because they don't think about creating a primary purpose. And so, you know, think about that. You know, if I get if I get 100 miles and say I get you know I get a $50 deduction on 100 miles, rounding a little bit, and I'm in a 40% uh, uh, tax bracket, that's 20 bucks. That's 20 bucks. If if I was walking down the street and saw a $20 bill, would I pick it up? But but you got to write it down. You got to write down my beginning mileage, my ending mileage, business purpose, that's it. and the date. You got it. And I just made twenty bucks. I just made twenty bucks by doing that. See, that's a lot of money to me. So driving is one place where I think people miss a lot of their deductions because they don't think what their primary purpose is. I go to the post office and back. Okay, there's there's a couple ways to do that too. And let's say I have a routine trip. I always go to the bank post office, and that's a ten mile round trip. Uh, if you do that, you don't have to keep track of every time. You you can, you know, that we, we call that we have a name for that. We you know we call that hardcore writing it down. You know, sure, you know, forcing. It. But you get to say, okay, I, I get one a week. Okay, one one week one week a month. I can keep track of my mileage, and then I could I could accumulate that mileage. I could do it for one month and take those miles times twelve if it's a routine. If I drive the bank every day for ten miles, that's fifty miles a week. You know, and I, I can prove that, but it's documentation, documentation, documentation. Without the documentation, the IRS can be a little, I mean, uh, technically, they, technically they can take it away if you don't have the documentation. There was, a, there was a, a liquor salesman in New York City that called on grocery stores to sell, I think, beer or liquor to, and he didn't, have, he didn't document his mileage. And even though he, he could show that he was at those liquor stores, even, uh, those grocery stores, even though he had a letter from his employer saying he was required to go through this, he had all that. Give that to the tax court. The tax court said, no, the law is quite clear. You've got to have documentation. It has to be contemporaneous. And so, you know, a lot of auditors will be okay with this, but technically, so I've got to plan for the worst and hope for the best. So what about driving back to work? Home, 
to work, never deductible. Home to work, never deductible. Can't do that. We'll come back to that. What about deducting a portion at home? Booth renters, listen closely. Booth renters, listen closely. Owners, listen closely. Both of you, but booth renters especially. Here's the rules around often at home, and a lot of the accountants are a little squeamish about it. I'm not. I've never had anybody audited because they had office in the home. I've had people have office in the home. I've won every case on that because we keep good records. We have good documentation. Without documentation, we've got to lose. Let me show you the rules. Here's the rules. Okay, watch closely. Is part of your home used in connection with your trade or business? Yeah, I have an office in my home. It's, it's in my home, it's back there, it's where my computer is, it's where I got some magazine stored, it's where I got my records, my all this stuff. Okay, so the answer that's yes. Okay, now here we're going to get a hurdle. Do you regularly use your home office for business? Now regular, what's that mean? I have no idea. So I, I think 10 to 12 hours a week. Okay, now it's going to be hard for some of you, but you know, if that's where you're keeping your QuickBooks records, if that's where you're ordering supplies, if that's where you're making a deposit, maybe it's going to add up a little faster than you think. That's where you're sitting reading magazines. That's where you're doing education tapes, all that. Keep track of that. Maybe you're going to win. The more hours, the better. I say 10 to 20. I say 10 to, oh, excuse me, 10 to, 15, 10 to 12 hours a week is my regular. So let's say we pass that. I, I, I pass that. I pass this. I pass that. Do you, do you, okay, here's a second hurdle. Do your home office exclusively? Okay, that means it can't be anything else. Can't be a spare bedroom. Can't be the family room. Can't be part of the kitchen. I had a client call me, I think it was two years ago, and she said, Larry, I was dealing. One of our CPAs worked on her text I was dealing with Teresa, and Teresa said I can't claim off in the home. You told me I can claim off in the home. She had a little edge to her voice, and I said, Well, I, you know, I think you qualify. Tell me what's different. She said, well, we, we, we sold our house and moved into a new house. I said, oh, where's your office? Well, it, I just have a, it's, it's, it's part of the kitchen. I just have a, my desk is in the kitchen. Uh-uh. She lost exclusivity, okay? So therefore, she couldn't claim. So she was a no, okay? So over here, is this your principal place of business? Well, no, it's not unless you have your salon in your house, okay? So that didn't work. Let's go down. Do you meet clients there? No, that don't work. So you go down. Do you have a separate structure? No, that don't work. Oh, we're losing, we're losing. Uh-oh, here we are. Do you perform administrative or management tasks at home at no other fixed location? Yes, we win. We qualify, okay? So I think if your circumstances are right, if you can pass this test, a regular test, and the exclusivity test, you know, and you're doing administrative work at home, you may qualify for us in the home. Okay. Now, let me show you. Is it worth it? Well, let me show you. Three hundred thousand dollar house, eleven percent office, thirty-five percent tax bracket. Here's our indirect expenses, our mortgage interest, all these guys right here. I'm not going to take a lot of time on this. I just kind of show you. What, and everybody's numbers are different. Here's our indirect expenses. Here's cleaning. I brought my son in. I clean. You know, he cleans the he. He, he vacuums and, and cleans stuff like that for $800. And then I, I, I had some repairs to that office. Uh, I painted it. Oh, and I bought a new, uh, I, I bought a new flat screen TV, okay, for $1,200. And so I got that in there. Oh, that was indirect. Actually, that would be direct over here. So anyway, so I have $5,000 worth of deductions, which saves me $1,800, guys. And I got to make $2,500 to bring home $1,800. So, you know, that's 135 heads of hair at 50 bucks a pop at a 38% gross profit margin. Now, booth renters, your gross profit margin is going to be a lot different than that, but owners are going to be right at 38%. Follow? Follow? Isn't that cool? And that's not it. That's not your only savings because, because uh, if, you, um, if you do that, yeah, and here's your percentages. You can do by percentages, and, and there's some rules about that. You'll get this. Here's the things you can deduct. And, but if you do that, you know, you also now qualify driving back to work. Work is deductible. So that's the big deduction right there is driving back and forth to work. So, so anyway, some people say, yeah, but you know what? I'm going to just recapture that if I ever sell my house. No, you just have to recapture the depreciation. It's not a big deal. Uh, uh, you still get the tax-free exchange. Yeah, but it's a red flag. It's a red flag. Yeah, IRS is going to tell you it's a red flag. 
That's how they scare you. They're going to tell you, hey, it's a red flag, can't do that. But like I said, I've had clients never have one audited because of office and home. I've won every one, but my clients have good records. I had a client, this was not a salon client, I had a doctor client that, uh, that raised uh, exotic animal, exotic uh, 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 cattle and uh, got audited and had a huge deduction, I mean, a huge deduction for cattle and also in the home, but he had a separate book that he kept track of all the time that he spent on the phone talking to different people that, that do this. He, he, we had pictures of, and now the IRS actually looks at your office, we had pictures of his office and there was nothing in there except uh, you know, except his computer and, and, and books, all these kind of books about these exotic animals. So you got to have documentation. I mean, that's the deal. Documentation, documentation, documentation. That's where it's at, man. you got to have that. Uh, and you're going to have these slides. I, I want to put these in. Solomon was a case in 2009 where the Supreme Court said he can take off some home. Well, what happened was, and they, the Supreme Court read the, read the law and read the Solomon case and said, Solomon, you don't qualify. But then the Congress got to hell down and said, that's not what we had intended. So since 1999, Austin Hall has been allowable. It's an allowable deduction. Here's, uh, here's some stuff uh, right out of the tax code on it. Here is some stuff right out of the IRS pub on it. Here's some stuff right out of the IRS pub. You know, you, you can have an office in your salon, uh, but it's okay if you do it at home. Is that's where you do it all. If you hire another company, if you occasionally at a fixed location, you're okay. Uh, equipment, I want to tell you about equipment. I want to talk about remodeling. Okay, I'm going to use a couple of numbers here. Section 179, section 179. You can deduct up to $139,000 worth of new or used equipment this year. Next year, unless Congress acts, it drops to 25000 So if you're looking at doing any major remodeling, or any major improvements in equipment, and you need the tax deduction, do it this year. If you're only going to do $10,000 a year, do it when it's most feasible. But this year, if you're going to do major, you're going to spend over 139, you need the deduction. Otherwise, you've got to take it over five to seven years. That's section 179. The other section, and the reason I give you these sections is you know, in case you talk to your accountant. The other section is 168. 168 is only good this year, and that's going to allow you to deduct 50% of your leasehold improvements this year. If, you do, if you're going to do leasehold improvements in the next couple of years, I suggest you think about doing it this year because you're going to deduct 50% this year, and the rest is deducted over 39 years. I don't care if you have a five-year lease, 10-year lease. It's 39 years. It doesn't, go, it doesn't match with your leach. It matches with the law. So if you have a $100,000 remodel job you're going to do, just a remodel job, you take $50,000 this year, the other $50,000 is deducted over 39 years. Now, if, if you wait till next year and do it, unless Congress acts, which they may, who knows those guys, unless Congress acts, it's 39-year property. So that $100,000 piece of remodeling, you'd get to take $2,500 a year for 39 years. Now, I don't know about you guys, but in 39 years, I, I'm, I'm going to be pushing up, uh, pushing up daisies. And so I, the faster way to take the depreciation, the better. So it's 50% this year, 168 is 50% this year, uh, 179 next year. Leasing versus purchasing is a question I get really maybe is not a tax question as much as a financial question. But it depends on the numbers. Most leases to salon have a really high built-in interest rate. And uh, if you're purchasing, you know, sometimes you can buy a little better. Uh, whether you're leasing and purchasing doesn't really make a whole lot of difference for tax purposes. I don't make any difference to me as far as tax purposes are concerned. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, if you have a line of credit, maybe you don't want to type your line of credit. But what we usually do to tell our clients is send us the numbers, tell us what it's going to cost to purchase, tell us what it's going to cost to lease, and we'll tell you what the built-in interest rate is. Usually, it's sometimes in the 20 percent if you're leasing. So let's take a look at it before we go forward. Oop. Here's tax-free money. I got a golf club. So I got golf clubs. Uh, a lot of people who live on golf courses, when the, ma when the major golf tournaments come in, they rent their houses out to the golf pros. They move out, like people at the Olympics, moved out of town. And there's a little de minimis rule within the tax law that says if, if you rent out your house for less than 14 days, if you rent out your house, your cabin, or your boat uh, for less than 14 days, there's no tax. And, and you can still claim all your expenses. 
So why am I talking about the anybody live on a golf course? Anybody have a boat or a cabin? Do you want to rent out? 14 days is kind of a cute thing. Here's what I do. Last year, I well, let's make this salon owner. Salon owner rents out her house to her company for two days. Uh, one, one in the spring, one in the fall. Spring, it was a uh, staff party. Fall was the, the company retreat. And, and I do this every year, every year. Between my partners and I, we, we revolve this around. And, they pay me $1,200. Got to be a reasonable amount. How did I come up with $600 a time? Uh, if I went out to uh, you know, Holiday Inn or I went to a meeting center and stayed there, you know, it was about $400. I want to be on the high side of reasonable, so it's 600 bucks. That saved me $408 worth of taxes because I got to deduct this on my, on my business side. I didn't have to pay tax on it. And so I asked $3,350 clients. So think about that. You know, next time, you know, and take pictures, you know, at the party and, you know, uh, all the food at your parties. Uh, trouble and lodging, food is usually 50% deductible. But at your, st at your staff parties, that's 100% deductible. We're having a party in a couple of weeks. And, and excuse me, it's 100% deductible. All the food's deductible. So, so keep track of that. We usually have our clients have two expense items uh, for, for, for meals and entertainment. One is 50%, one is 100%. A lot of times people miss that 100% uh, uh, meals and lodging for, for training meetings and, and uh, for, uh, for staff retreats and that type of thing, 100% deductible. Oh, there's our 33 heads of hair. I'll get them out of here really quickly. There they go. So anyway, there's a... What a guy gets to this. Uh, I realize a lot of uh, I realize a lot of um, uh, booth rentals out there that maybe don't have gift gift certificates. But if you do have gift certificates, you should talk to your accountant uh, because most of you probably are paying tax on gift certificates when you get them, uh, when you sell them. And so, for example, I sell in December. I sell twenty thousand dollars worth of gift certificates. I don't redeem them until. January, February, March, uh, I pay tax on uh, 20000 when I file my December tax return in April. There's a way to change that. It's called becoming an accrual basis taxpayer. And with a lot of our clients, we switch them from cash to accrual basis, and they don't have to pay a tax on the 20000 until they're redeemed, which uh, you know, I don't want to pay the IRS any sooner than I don't want to pay any more than I have to, and I don't want to pay them any sooner than I have to either. So that's kind of where I'm there. Uh, we can get away. My wife and I, when we own the salon, we always went. You know, pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. We always went within a reasonable distance never flew to a place, always driving range. And we spent two days, we, we, we call it our, it was, you know, we're in the fashion business. And we went around to different uh, stores and, uh, and went to Nordstrom's and went to all these different places, found out what the fashion was like. We, we would document everything. We stayed at a nice place. I was president of the company. She was an employee. Uh, stayed at a nice place. Uh, when I came home, she got in front of her staff at the staff meeting and said, here is my... Uh, Here's my, uh, 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 you know, here's the things we learned at the staff meeting, and we got to deduct all of it. And so, I mean, it was uh, it was all deductible. And so, if, if we had a thousand dollar, which was a great time, I had a great time doing it. I I never had that audited. I wish I would have, so I could tell you. And the IRS audited me on that, and they said it was okay. I don't, and they didn't, but they didn't audit me. Uh, but. You know, I, I think if you got the documentation, which your primary purpose are going, and, uh, you know, we brought back tales. I mean, it was primary purpose. It was the girl that said, uh, uh, when we asked her about shoe fashion at Nine West Shoes, she said, uh, well, I don't know much about shoes. Uh, I don't know much about fashion, but we got these over here that are on sale today. You know, we went to our staff and said, hey, you don't want to be like that. Or here's what happened to us at Nordstrom's. Uh, we asked a lady where to eat in Kansas City, and she said, you know what, here's a place I would recommend. Let me see if I can get you in. She picked up the phone and called in and got us a reservation. Now, that was great customer service. That's the type of stuff we took back to our staff. And so does it work? It works for us. And that's not me, by the way. I don't weigh that much. The first two, uh, who put that in there? Danny, did you put that in there? The first two were for tax fraud, the last 22 six. You know, everything I'm telling you today, I'm not an over-the-top accountant that says, hey, I think we can get away with this. I hear people talk about, hey, we can get away with this. Everything I'm telling you is works. It's true. We use it all the time. Meals for staff, keep track of it, certainly deductible. Uh, 
uh, you know, it's fifty percent deductible, so buy twice as much. Uh, is that the way? Uh, that, the way that works? But it's fifty percent deductible. But make sure you keep track of it. Uh, just write it down. Write it down. Documentation. 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 Uh, magazines. I deduct every magazine. I deduct every magazine, even if I get them at home. Maybe I get the newspaper at home, get it at the slot. I'm always looking. You know what? And you know one of the things that we talk to our clients about, this isn't tax, this is more on our, our accounting end or financial end, is you know, I don't I, I I don't know if I want people distracted by negative things in my my front lobby. I don't know if I want people looking at uh, 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 you know, Newsweek or Time Magazine, seeing all the terrible things that are going on. I want positive things out there. And so maybe American Swan, you know, maybe some Swan Magazines, that type of thing. That's just my opinion. But I deduct them all. Write it down. Uh, this, is, I guess, this is kind of a warning. I never see the IRS uh, actually look at this too close, but if you're doing gifts to your, gifts to your clients, there's a $25 per year limit on gifts to clients, $25 per year limit. Believe it or not, isn't that terrible? And I know we don't we don't follow that rule. Anybody from the IRS, we follow that rule. But uh, but you know it's really hard to find gifts. It's been twenty five dollars as long as I can remember. And, uh, and I've been doing this for forty years, and so uh, they've never in inflation that. So anyway, and for for staff, gifts are supposedly taxable. Also, unless it's non cash, if you. If you give if you give cash, if you give a Christmas gift to your class uh, staff, or then a deductible, uh, uh, if it's cash, it's taxable. If you give them a uh, 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 gift, a watch or something like that, it's not taxable. Now this is what we were talking to Jenny talked about at the beginning. We do a second opinion. Usually it's three hundred fifty dollars for the second opinion. What we do is we take your 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 tax returns, we take your financial statements, we pour over them, we look at them, we spend at least four hours looking at them. I mean that because what I mean I'll be honest with you, this is how we can show you our stuff. We get to start our stuff. We then call you up. I'm talking to you on the phone just like I am right now. It's on your screens, on my screen, just like it is right now. And and I go through it with you. I look at your tax return. I tell you, should it be an S corporation, a C corporation, LLC? Hey, are you missing these deductions? Have you considered office in the home? Are, you know, are, how old are your children? Uh, can you put them to work? You know, they can earn $3,950. Uh, you know, I, I, the more I know about you, the more I can save you. And we're doing it for $150. And I, I think there's, uh, you just get a hold of Amanda here. That's her hauling in the background. Here, I've been talking about her, A-H-A-U-M-O-N-T at cupsod.com or call us at this 800 number, or write us at this here, and, uh, and we'll uh, sign you up. We send, what happens is, very simple, we send you a, uh, a little questionnaire. You tell me a little bit about your salon, how many square feet, or if you're a booth renter, we have a booth renter questionnaire, how long you've been doing it, and what's your charges, and that type of thing, when did you raise prices last, and da da da. With little two-page questionnaires you can fill out from the top of your head. And then, you send that to us along with your QuickBooks and tax returns, and then we dig into them. And, and, uh, and like I say, we did that for $150 for you guys because Jenny's been kind enough to have us on board, and we really appreciate having the opportunity to be here. It's, it's what we do. I love working with swans. It's not that we're smarter than anybody else. Uh, it's just what we do. So I know back bar percentages. I know uh, compensation formulas. I know, uh, you know what your retail cost should be. I know what's happening. We, we work with distributors. I know what's happening in the industry. Uh, uh, get all read all the salon night my, read all the salon magazines. My wife says uh, I just uh, I just look at the pictures, but I actually read the magazines. So um, I told Jennifer I'd be an hour exactly, and uh, according to my stopwatch here, I'm 30, 58 minutes and 43 seconds. So I got one more minute. I just take that time to say thank you, thank you, Jenny. I think I I think I was just probably cut this off. You didn't tell me to do anything differently. And so if you are interested uh, in second opinion, uh, let us know. I'd love to get a chance to save you some money. That's why we're here. So uh, thank you all. Bye. Thank you, Larry. Oh, Denny, you are there. Okay. Yes, I am. You want to close that then? Um, that would be great. I actually did just receive a question a few minutes ago from someone okay. um, that would be good to address. They were asking okay. about the um, the gift um, annual amount of $25 if that was per person or total. 
That's a, that's a gift per person, and it does not include the wrapping and postage, believe it or not. <laughs> okay, so and and that's per year. So if you know, if at the beginning of the year I send somebody a fifteen dollar, uh, you know, cr uh, Christmas ball or something like that, and then later, uh, and then later in the or a birthday present for fifteen dollars, and then later in the year I send them a uh, rum cake. Uh, okay. Just Crazy. Uh, that was worth fifteen dollars. That's thirty. See, I can only deduct twenty-five, and five dollars is not deductible. Now, what if I give them product? Uh, I think I'm okay with product. I don't have a problem with that because I don't consider that a gift. I consider that a promotion. Okay. So if I give them, if somebody has uh, something come up, I give them, you know, some hairspray and, and some mousse, whatever the case. I don't call that a gift. I think that's a promotion, so I don't keep track of that. Okay. Make sense. Excellent. And, and to your staff, though, to your staff, to your staff, it's fifty dollars, and it cannot be cash. It cannot even be a gift certificate. There's a court case on a gift certificate. If if you give more than that, then uh, if you give more than fifty, or you give them cash or equivalent of cash, then you got to put it on their W two. Okay. Perfect. Thanks so much, Larry. Um, if you Thanks. have any other specific questions for Larry, go ahead and send those to Amanda, and her email is a h a u m o n t at copsaodi.com. And the handouts that Larry referred to throughout the presentation, um, the checklists and things like that, are actually going to be posted on our website along with the webinar recording in 72 hours. All of you will automatically receive a link to that exact location, so keep your eyes peeled for that to come. Otherwise, thank you so much, Larry, and it was a great webinar. Thanks for attending. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.